What makes the case? Okay. Guys, 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 guys. I, I said last time, I'll say it again, chat. Guys, these videos, are, they're, they're really, really good. They're really interesting. And, and you have to kind of pay attention, so give it a chance. But um, they're kind of dark, okay? So the, the, these are these are very bad people that did really, really bad things. So, you know, viewer description is advised. Jennifer Pan unique among others in the true crime genre. Okay. Hold up. What makes the case of Jennifer Pan unique among others in the true crime genre is the overabundance of raw footage freely available in the public domain. There is over 11 hours of material that not only recounts her entire life in meticulous detail, but gives us considerable insight into her psychopathological state. Jennifer herself will narrate her own story in this video, which is the reason the following lead-up segment will be condensed, as a brief outline is all that is needed before Jesus. delving into the extraordinary mind of this individual. Jennifer was born in Markham, Ontario, where she was raised with her older brother in a middle-class household. Her parents, Beek and Han, were originally from Vietnam, and their method of parenting was strict, very strict, what some might even class as authoritarian. Success and achievement from their children were seen as outright obligations, whether it be in academics or extracurricular activity, and some might argue these expectations took precedence over the well-being of the children themselves. Jennifer initially took the imposed pressure in her stride and put everything she had into figure skating. She had exceptional talent and at one point was expected to compete in the Winter Olympics, but Jesus. she suffered a serious knee injury at the age of 14 and was told she could no longer compete. Her dreams were cut short, but of that more concern was that her parents' expectations now had to be met through the more traditional route of education. And the issue was that Jennifer wasn't anywhere near as academically gifted as she was athletic. She was averaging a C- minus when her parents wanted straight A's. So rather than communicate with them, she decided to meet their expectations under false pretenses and began faking her test results. C minus. This led to her faking her end of year report cards, which eventually led to her faking a high school diploma and then a university what? acceptance letter to study pharmacology. Wait, in the abstract Wait, C minus in high school? For, for diploma for high, and then high a school university diploma. acceptance letter to study pharmacology. In the abstract world of her parents, Jennifer was on her way to a noble and well-paid career in medical health care, when in reality, she was a high school dropout living with her drug dealer boyfriend, whom she had been dating in secret for almost eight years. She was eventually found out in 2010 when her parents discovered she had been living a double life, and was then given an ultimatum. At 24 years old, she had to choose between one of two options. Option one was that she had to live at home under a strict regime, cease all contact with her boyfriend, and only leave the house to go back to school and pursue an education. Jesus. Option two was that she could do whatever she wanted, but she would then be disowned from her family. She Jesus. could never return home, and all financial support would cease immediately. Jennifer evidently decided neither option would suffice, so she created option number three. She had her boyfriend arrange a mock home invasion where three of his acquaintances would enter the Pan household and stage a robbery gone wrong. The two instructions were to first ransack the home and then murder the parents. The planned date was Monday the 8th of November with guys, the scheduled time being- Guys, other streamers watch this, right? There's no like really TOS stuff in there, right? It's, it's, kinda, it's kinda dark, but it's not. We can watch the whole thing? Roughly 11 p.m. Jennifer would unlock the front door and three figures were caught on a neighbor's surveillance camera entering the home at 11.05. They were then seen running out just under 18 minutes later. It was at that exact time 911 received a call from the same household. That's disturbing. Hello. Hello. Ma'am, I need to know your address. Avenue Row, can you please spell it? Please spell it Avenue. My dad just went outside screaming. Ma'am, can you spell the street address for me, please? Beak Pan was shot twice, once in the neck and once in the head. 
She was killed immediately. The father, Han, was also shot twice, once in the shoulder and once in the face. He astonishingly survived and was put into an induced coma once he arrived at the hospital. Jennifer was taken to the same hospital as a precaution, but was soon cleared of injury. She sat by her father's survived. bedside for roughly three hours before she was taken to the Markham police station to give a statement as a witness. I want to go through a form with you. It may seem kind of, you know, why you're doing this, but um, this is a, it's, it's like you're, you're swearing to tell the truth about what you're going to talk to me about. And it's also going to explain to you the, um, the penalties for not telling the truth. I don't expect you uh, to help me, but for a homicide uh, investigation... You're doing murder relax now, I'm telling Azan. Hey, you fuck ass. So, listen, I, I was probably the first one to watch any of these videos and, and tell us about it, okay? Azan was uh, one of the more last stuff saying, Oh, Azan controls react. Azan controls everything. Azan only reacts, you fuck ass. No shit, he watches everything. That's all he does, you fucking moron. Close to the investigation, we do this with, okay? So this isn't suspecting that you're not going to tell the truth. This is more of a feature that you understand the importance of telling the complete truth. Jennifer is not a suspect at this moment. She is only giving a voluntary statement under oath. She has not read her right to silence, but instead informed of her rights as a witness. She is basically Ooh. told that fabricating evidence with the intent to mislead is an offense. After reading the notification off paper, the detective gives Jennifer a more human explanation of the instruction. What I've just explained to you is you're here voluntarily to help us that you don't have to talk to us if you don't want to but the importance of talking to us and if you're talking to us the importance of telling the truth and if you don't tell the truth there's criminal consequences for not telling the truth that's all that all that stuff had to deal with okay the investigator then leaves to get the commissioner of oaths which is for the purpose of swearing in the witness but he first brings in a box of why would you do this i mean why would you do this because if she thinks she has a chance of, of, of uh, getting away with it or whatever, I mean, her her saying, I don't want to say anything, I mean, literally, it, even though it, it kind of helps her, I mean, it doesn't, because it's her parents, so it, it, it's terrible. This is universally recognized as getting startled, yet the official term in neurophysiology is the startle reflex via auditory stimulus. Hyperarousal from a traumatic event can often exaggerate this response in a manner similar to how Jennifer reacted to the sound of the door. Hello, my name is Andrew Lespiro. I'm the Commissioner of Oaths with the York Regional Police. I'm here so you can give a truthful statement, either by solemn affirmation or swearing on the Bible. Which okay. do you prefer? Swearing on the Bible. Just put your hand on the Bible. On the Bible. Do you, Jennifer Pan, swear that the evidence you shall give on this investigation shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God? I do. G guys, what? G guys, I... I don't want to make this a, a religious discussion chat, but what, what if uh, somebody uh, needs to be sworn in and he's uh, of another religion or whatever? The, did they swear on, on another book? Or is it only for the Bible? Can they not swear on the, on the scrolls? Jennifer is... Oh, so they, so, so they, 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 they could do the, the their, their book or scroll or whatever. Sworn in. The lead investigator returns to collect the statement. Now I want you to... Sort of take yourself Guys! Back to earlier on today, uh, yesterday, meaning I'm getting mad now. Of November. Guys, this, guys, so, some the scrolls. Um, I've I've studied this, guys. We have I had religion class when I was younger. S some books they they come in two big rolls and you roll them out. And uh, the Torah. Your day. Okay, start at any point in time, where wherever you feel comfortable, and then, then we're gonna move. We're going to move forward, okay? Um, yesterday, probably around 9 o'clock in the morning, 9, 9.30. Buzzing. Um, my mother, <clears throat> she woke me up and she told me that she was going to, going to visit my grandfather. Throughout the day, Jennifer explains that she practiced piano, studied piano history, talked on the phone with her friends, and had dinner with her parents. Her mother left for line dancing at 8 p.m. and returned home at about 9.30, at which time Jennifer was alone in her room watching TV, ready to go to sleep. And then, suddenly I just heard my mom calling for my dad to come down. 
and that's when I lowered the volume on my TV, and I could hear the voices weren't any voices I was very familiar with. And so I was scared, and I couldn't move. I just sat in my room for a while. Jesus. And then I thought I heard them all let, like leave the top floor, and I peered out of my bedroom door. And a guy was there, and he came at me and had string in his hands and tied my arms back and said, I have a gun behind your back. Do what I say. If you do what I say, then no one will get hurt. Where is the money? Show me where your money is. Guys, guys you, you would think that she would have rehearsed this or practiced this because this is the story she's got to stick with for the whole way through, right? My mom From kept trying to get up and they kept telling her to sit down. And so I didn't want her to get hurt. So I told her, Mom, sit down. They were trying to find her wallet, but she, her English isn't good, so she kept saying first. They kept pushing her down onto the chair. Okay. Take your time. Yeah, that's Cap. Take your time. All this is very important, so take your time. Jennifer's nonverbal communication up to this point has made sense, and the reflection of her mother's last moments seems to push her over the edge. It could be assumed the detective still considers Jennifer a victim at this moment, but in the next moment, he will start becoming suspicious. They kept all the lights off on the main floor. The only time there was light was when they opened the fridge door to see if they could find where my mom's purse was. Take yourself back to a moment in your life when you have been overwhelmingly upset about something, and at the same time were trying to explain to someone why you were upset. You wouldn't quietly and reservedly convey the events. You would likely blurt them out in a forceful and disordered manner. Your sole focus would be on processing your thoughts and conveying them into speech. The emotional turbulence of severe hysteria and grief makes it very difficult to convey thought into actual dialogue, and the simple wording of a sentence becomes very challenging. Jennifer seems to be more concentrated on how she's being perceived, yet finds her words easily and executes her sentences perfectly. One of the th yeah, and then and then says her story about the, it's it's all dark and they're looking in the fridge for the purse. The gentleman asked my father if he had money in his wallet and where his wallet was. So they took me, because I was next to the stairwell, they took me up the stairs to sh show them where my father's wallet was, but I'm, I didn't know. They had turned the room upside down. I didn't know where his pants were at that time. The intruders retrieve $1,100 from the master bedroom and then tie Jennifer to the upstairs banister. Next thing I know, I think I heard my parents going down the stairs and my mom was asking them for me to come with them. They wouldn't let me come with them. And after they said, the last thing I heard them say was, you lied, you lied to us, you lied to us. And then I heard two pops. My mom screamed. I yelled out for her. And a couple more pops. Okay. Take your time. Take your time. Also, you know, he knows she's capping. And I think I heard my mom say, or moan or something and then they did one more before they left and then one of the guys said we have to go now it's been too long and then they ran out the door and I think once they were out the door I heard my dad go up the stairs and at that point Jennifer has clearly gotten her story straight beforehand yet in the next moment appears to realize how unusual it is that she was able to make a phone call when her hands were tied behind her back to a banister she hesitates stutters and even looks to the detective for approval twice Thanks, before she quickly moves on I had my phone in my pot in my Oh, Jesus that I had hidden there that they didn't know about ah that was so bad before she quickly moves on. I had my phone in my po in my on me behind me. Oh, dude, that was, I I that was painful. That I didn't know about. So I had my phone in my po in my on me behind me that I had hidden there that they didn't know about. So when I when I 
when they when I thought that they had heard them all leave and my dad ran up the stairs, I whipped up the phone and I called. Okay, mom. chat, that was some of the, that was legitimately cringe but though. I, I still hadn't heard anything from my mom and all I could hear was my dad running on the street just moaning and making sounds. The detective then breaks the event down into components and has Jennifer go through each moment in more detail. The first of which is the appearance of the intruders. Jennifer now describes the one who appeared to be in charge. The only thing I can remember was him was he had dreadlocks. He had dreadlocks. So are you, uh, it, can you describe his race to me? He was black. Did it, was his head covered? Was his face covered? Do you remember anything about that? Just that his dreadlocks were like, kind of like flopping all over the place. I couldn't really see his face and they kept the lights dark as much as, as much as possible. Did he have a gun? Yes. As much as possible. I only saw the top part of it. What did it look like? Um, I, I guys, it's, listen. It was black. Yeah. Do you know where the other guys involved in this are? I know one stayed with my parents downstairs. Okay. Um, the other one, I'm not, at that point in time, I was more focused on him, like he was seeing me and he was coming after me. So you're so saying there's three for sure? That's all, you saw a total of three at one time, you saw three people yes. together? Yes, when I went downstairs, okay. I saw three shadows. She details the appearances of the other two assailants, whom guys, she asserts- Guys, really, I'll talk about this, Jeff, because they, these give people do things that are so evil, but it, it, it's just that you would think somebody would do something so, so uh, horrific and like all in, that they would be like better or whatever, but she, like- were also black This males. is embarrassing. The detective then brings her back to the one in charge. Now the first guy who spoke to you, what kind of, did he have any accent? None Is it clear? that I could make out. Was it clear English? English. Unbroken? Unbroken. No accent? From the terms he used, I didn't get to pick up an accent, no. He so used short phrases. He sounded, he sounded Canadian? I would say, yes, he was born here. He was born here. She asserts that the second intruder didn't speak, while the third had a Caribbean accent. She then goes on to say she was taken downstairs for a brief moment and saw her parents under guard in the living room. Her father was asked where his wallet was, and he told them it was in the master bedroom. Jennifer was then taken back upstairs alone with two of the assailants to help them find it. What? They don't find the wallet, but instead retrieve a pile of cash from inside the nightstand. Jennifer was then tied to the upstairs banister and left alone as the intruders went back down. And the next thing I can hear are them telling my parents to move to the basement. Okay. And I'm asking them, why, where are you going? And my mom's yelling to me, I want my daughter. Why can't my daughter come too? I want my daughter. Jennifer then hears one of the intruders yell, you lied to us. Who do you hear yelling you lied to us or to Number that extent? Number three. Number three. To my, I'm assuming it's to my father because he was the one asking for the wallet. Now you hear this commotion downstairs. You said you heard two pops and you heard who scream? My mom. Your mom. And what was she screaming? Do you I remember? make it out. It yeah. was kind of like a cry, cry yell, so it was just... Okay. They had made the first round, or pop, pop, and they, has, they had said, okay, that's enough. Let's go. So disgusting, Who dude. That? Whose voice is that? Number one. Okay. And then I heard one more after that, and they were like, that's enough. Let's go. Okay. And again, that's number one. Yes. So what do you hear next? After you hear the scrambling, they're gone, because you're hearing no more. I gather that's how you assume they're gone, is because you don't hear it. Then you hear your dad. I, I reach for my phone at okay. that point. Okay, and you call 911, okay? When your father exits, you hear the door open, because you hear the door Yeah, of course, these are all liars. Like oh, shit. Noises. Okay. It's like the wind coming in, and I just hear my dad, uh, I think he's... Right, uh, really? Really, dude? Right. You think that he sustained some kind of injury because he's not, you can't understand what he's saying. Okay. What about, do you, do you can you hear your mom? Yeah, yeah. She's talking about her parents, her parents dying in, in like a, some crazy investigation about people that, that, that she should care about and she, all, she says, uh. Okay. Where does your dad go? Do you know where, you never see your dad again until we're, we're at the hospital. I think that's what you said, right? 
I saw him when he was on the gurney. Is there any reason to suspect or anything that's happened in the recent weeks leading up that would have you guys be a target of some type of incident like this? We live a straightforward, kind of almost routine life. Whenever Jennifer smiles, it takes her a couple seconds to realize she's not exhibiting the correct behavior, and she then snaps back into her solemn stare. The two looks are so diametrically opposed to each other that it becomes glaringly obvious she's forcing one of the emotions. What, in your opinion, would cause people to target your house to think that there was a large quantity of money? I'm not sure. Now, you say your mom drives a Lexus. It could be because of the aesthetics, yes. What about your dad? He drives a Mercedes and he loves that baby. Is that right? Yes. The questions end here, and the detective leaves the room for half an hour to double check if he needs any more information. After 15 minutes of Jennifer waiting alone, we're gifted with another performance of the startle reflex, only this time it's slightly less convincing. If investigators were certain of Jennifer's innocence, this would have been the first and last time she would have been questioned in such a manner. Police are extremely careful in how they involve victims in investigations as to not cause further unnecessary trauma. But on this particular occasion, it would come as no surprise that Jennifer's psychological well-being this was of terrible. less concern. She was officially still a victim and witness, but unofficially a leading suspect. She was called back in to give another statement just two days later at 9 a.m. She was two told days. the reason was to collect more details, but you'll notice that the line of questioning and the answers they attained Guys, had little to no use for anything outside of Jennifer's culpability. You want me to cut the mic? Hold up. The actual reason for this second statement is to collect further information to use against her at a later stage. In this interview alone, they already start the process of cross-examination and start to catch her out in previous lies. Jennifer... What? Oh, thank you. You too? Yeah, I'm cozy here. I need a new chair though. Okay. is still a witness what? at this moment, and the exchange is void of any direct confrontation. Yet she is still put under a modest amount of pressure, and the holes in guys, her story start to become ever more apparent. You guys, you guys, I have a good question, chat. Even if they have the slight thought that, that, that it, this is a leading suspect or whatever, two whole days, don't they do anything like a um, like flight risk list or something? Or like anything at all, even if, if they can hide like the, the maneuver or something? Because two whole days... For somebody who they think is even possibly involved, that's, that seems really risky. No. Take that first interview that we had, which was, you know, hours after what, what had transpired. Put it aside. It's almost like we've never spoken before, okay? So we're starting afresh. We're starting from new. That way you're not going to say, I think I already told him that. Don't worry about what you've already told me. Do you, Jennifer Penn? Swear, declare that the evidence that you give in this investigation shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Huh. We're going to see if we've learned or if you've remembered anything else, and there's some questions with respect to that oh, uh, no. statement that I'm going to ask you about, okay? So, but I'm going to let you start again, and, and let's, let's move forward from any time in that day where you want to start, if it's the time you woke up or if it's the time that your first interaction, it's your choice. Okay, I'm just... I'm very nervous and I... Oh, she knows she's going to throw. That's it. That's the first why two, actually. Are you, why, are you, why are you nervous? Tell me about why you're nervous. Because I don't want to say the wrong thing. Oh, yeah, so... Because that you, day was a lot. You're right. And I've been scattered, and so bits and pieces are here, and some pieces aren't here, and I'm just... So, I want you to sit back in your chair... Okay, just sit back in your chair, take a deep breath, okay? Close your eyes, just follow my line, just sit back in the chair for a second, sit back, relax, as much as you can. Close your eyes, and just breathe for a minute, okay?
The most curious detail you've probably come to notice is this. It's known as a self-pacifying gesture. A person who does this is most often uncomfortable and sometimes fearful of what lies ahead. It's a coping mechanism to dissipate stress and afford self-assurance. What I can remember is when I woke up, I had some breakfast. She practices on the piano, studies piano history, plays games on her phone, and speaks with her friends on Facebook during the morning hours. Her mom leaves to visit her grandfather at around noon and returns at 3 p.m. to prepare dinner. Her father comes home at around 4.30 from work, and dinner is served one hour later. Her mother leaves for line dancing at 7, then returns at 9.30. Jennifer at this point is in bed talking with her friend on the phone, and her father is in the computer room. She then hears her mother loudly call out to her father. What is she saying? She's calling him by his name to come down. Okay, does, so give us verbatim what do you hear her saying? In Vietnamese. She's like, Hanoi, Soom Day. She's clearly aware that she has to appear mournful over the subject matter and sensibly draws out this emotion at the correct moments. Yet what's fascinating is how she's unable to maintain this emotion when inquired over the same elements. In this very moment, she appears completely grief-stricken, but when the investigator inquires further, this supposed grief rapidly dissipates. It's extremely difficult to convincingly act out an emotion while evaluating a question. It requires two completely different parts of the brain, which is why most people can only do one of these things at a time. This is exactly what you see in the next moment, and continuously throughout this interview. And what does that translate to? Interesting. Uh, That's my father's name, Han. Uh, come down here. Does she say anything else associated with that? With that? I can't hear clearly because, like, I was on the phone and the TV was on, sure. but that's what I heard. Is she yelling? Or is it uh, at normal? It's a loud, it's a, she's not yelling, but it's a loud tone. Okay. She then hangs up the phone with her friend okay, once she hears the I mean, it, I mean it's like, it, she goes from, from like, sound like, like she's crying to like doing like an oral presentation in high school or I'm something. I'm hanging up the phone with him. I hear footsteps going up the stairs. Okay. But they're not, they're heavier footsteps than what is to be expected from my parents. Okay. Jennifer hears unfamiliar voices, so she opens her door to investigate. She has spoken for two minutes up to this point without being interrupted, and once again manages to build up her emotion to correlate with a supposedly terrifying event. Yet as soon as the detective interjects with a question, we once again see this emotion dissipate. I peered out, and there was a person in the, my what would have been my brother's room. And where's your brother's room located? Uh, just. A little bit down the like I could see my from my doorway to his doorway just okay. a little bit down the hall okay the first intruder then robs Jennifer at gunpoint before taking her to the ground floor where she then sees her parents sitting next to each other from where I was standing my father was sitting on the right and my mother was sitting on the left sitting where on a couch on our couch sitting on the couch are they looking out towards you no, their backs are towards me. Okay. And you're now on the ground level? Are you on the floor? Or on the I'm sitting, sitting on, the, on the floor. I'm sitting on the floor. All right, where are your hands? They had tied my hands, so let's as go, I said. Let's go back up to oh, the stairs. No. Remember we said... Her emotional display in seeing her parents in distress gradually faded after each interjection. But you'll now see it completely cease altogether once she realizes that she made her first mistake. That's Everything real. she had said up to this point correlated with her initial statement, but she had just forgot to mention that she was first tied up before being taken downstairs, and only brought it up when reminded by the detective. Take the other statement and whatever we've said before. No, I, I said it earlier. She didn't say she was tied up earlier. She completely forgot to mention it and seems to be trying to convince the detective otherwise. It's a moment of slight panic, which becomes far more pronounced when you compare it to her supposed grief-stricken recollection five seconds earlier. The detective doesn't challenge this, as it can be used against her at a much later stage, and the main objective at this point is to collect as much conflicting information as possible. Okay, then we must, let's let's get back to that area. I think you might have touched on it. We went back into the description. So where does you, where do you get your hands tied and where does the string come from? I'm not sure where the string comes from, but he had the string. Okay. And he, after I gave him my money, that's when he tied my hands. She is then taken downstairs where she sees her mother being interrogated by the second assailant over the whereabouts of the cash. According to her first statement, the second assailant never said a word the entire time. He had pushed her back onto the couch and she Who kept- Who pushed her? 
and number two okay was pushing her back onto the couch and she she kept saying where's my purse where's my purse and the guy kept telling her to sit down and i didn't want my mom to get hurt oh god how many times does she get up and get pushed back down I'd say she got up twice. <sighs> Has number two uttered a word at this point in time? I can't remember hearing him. Okay. So we're just correcting what you said earlier because you said earlier that it was number two who was asking where the purse is, what are the purse is, and now you've said now it's number one guy who would I'm initially... Sorry, it's just... No, no, no. It's all a purpose. Because my lies are dog shit. Is I can't... clarifying what you're saying. So number I one is wanna... number one is the one who's doing the talking about the purse. Number three is focused on your dad's wallet. Okay. Jennifer continues to make contradictions and is forced to correct herself multiple times after she notices the puzzled gaze from the detective. He inquires over the appearance of assailant number two, who is wearing a hoodie, according to the first statement. Do you get a good look at number two now of what he's wearing? All I could tell was he had a vest, and his face was like a long oval face. He had a vest? No, hoodie. Okay. A uh, dark hoodie. Okay. Did did you see them recover anything inside your mom and dad's room? I did not see anything. No. Are you sure? Because uh, we would when we spoke the last that time, these... there was some mention of some other money that went missing. I believe when they were looking for my father's wallet, they had opened the drawer, and there was a, it was in an envelope. What drawer would that have been in? On my, on the, if you're in, at the door where I was standing on the left side. So bed, bad! So Whose side of the bed is it? That's my mother's side of the bed. Guys, did she, did she can't even get one part correct from the store that she gave them two days before? Not even one part! Okay. More than likely it's a total all wrong. coincidence, yet she almost appears to be praying that she gave the correct response. Fortunately for her, she was correct on this occasion. And approximately how much money? I'm not sure how much she took out for our our trip. But I can, o I can only estimate about a few hundred dollars. Few hundred because at the time, the last time or you told me, you were pretty adamant about about eleven hundred dollars. So I'm curious to know how you came up with that number. I believe because when we were at the border, we and we stopped at the duty free. My mother was deciding whether to use her U.S. currency or her uh, her U.S. currency or her Canadian currency. So it was at that time you remember hearing eleven hundred dollars, and that's what is that the inference you're saying is that because you're pretty solid, saying that it was eleven hundred dollars that went missing that was was taken, and that you saw it when we spoke. Hello. And who took it? Who took possession of the money? I'm sorry. It's, it's all right. The detective lets the contradiction slide once more. Jennifer is then brought to the moment where the intruders had just left and she is tied to the upstairs banister. Let's come back to now. You're being taken to the, the banister in the I'm upper sorry, room. I don't don't apologize, okay? I'm going to try and ask you questions to try and clarify points, okay? If you don't remember, you don't remember. Okay, so don't, there's no apologizing. The only reason you would apologize to me is if you've lied to me. Okay, no, so just, just, then in this case, then don't apologize to me. It's okay. Okay, I'm going to ask you questions to clarify points. Okay. You're now bound to this, to the, to the railing. Can you show me, can you stand up and turn around and tell me, just show on the camera, how your hands are bound and how you are against the railing. You don't have to sit down. I just need to see how you were. Just tell me. The only reason that I'm trying to, I, I need to uh, do this come on, man. is that I'm also going to ask you. Exactly, did. So take this back to, from, take it out of a traumatizing event, which it is, and put, put yourself into a more clinical position, because I want to see how you could physically get your phone out of your waistband. We're obviously going to need to She shouldn't visualize how he would look. So, 
traumatize a wife away, now put yourself into a just a state of I guys, need to man it mechanically show. Hey guys, I feel like she's thinking about okay, I gotta get this story out, but then I gotta remember it for next time they ask me about it because I just I already fucked up, right? And she, this is like a complete mental shutdown How at this point. How I can get access to my phone, okay? Because that's obviously very relevant. I, we know you made the phone call, but questions are going to obviously raise is that if my hands are bound and I'm against the railing, how do I talk to a 911 operator, okay? So clinically, this is now a clinical demonstration. Just stand up, focus in on how you did it. Tim Hortons. And I want you to stick that in your waistband as an example, okay? So take your, just take your sweat off, because this will be a very smooth, very quick thing. It's a one-time demonstration. I'm not gonna ask you to repeat it. The two critical parts of this demonstration are where Jennifer states she was tied and the movement of her arms as she takes her phone out of her pocket. Okay, the investigator see. is hoping the mechanics of the two components would be illogical and contradict each other. They tied my upper arm. Yes. Around the banister. Yes. But my hands were bound together. So your hands bound together, and this is the arm that's the, the strings wrapped around against the banister? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now how can you get to the phone? You can still kind of do it though. And how do you make the phone call? Whether it be a stroke okay. of luck or that Jennifer yeah. had prepared for this moment, this actually made sense. Had Damn. her arms gone left or the point of restraint been below the elbow, none of this would have been possible. Guys, I'll be honest, I guess I'll be I don't be too detective Andy, but I feel like at this point, the only things that she's that that, that she's been like uh, good at, whatever, are I feel like part of the stories that actually did happen. Then whenever she lies, she's terrible at it. It's perhaps the single moment where Jennifer's statement was somewhat beneficial to her defense. We know Jennifer was tied up when police arrived, but the assumption was that she had her phone in her hands the entire time and wouldn't have it's had to retrieve still... it from her waistband. She can now argue that this portion of her testimony is genuine. 911. And do you talk down like that? Yes, I'm yelling at the phone. Like nah, this. no shots. What can you hear? I turned the volume on max. Yes. So that's exactly the way that you're talking to her. Absolutely no shot. <laughs> okay, that's good enough. Sit down. Jennifer is then brought back to the moment just before she heard the gunshots. It works. You're saying it works, but I could be wrong about this, but I, th I think at the beginning, during the phone call, whatever you hear, you can hear the fucking mic popping. And you can only do that whenever you're actually fucking blowing air into the mic or some shit. Let's get up. And they're moving. And my mom's yelling. Where's my daughter? I want my daughter. Where's my daughter? And I'm yelling at mom, I'm here. Here. Jennifer, take it's a minute. It's not admissible evidence, but it helps them though. And just take a minute. You'll notice that she doesn't wipe her eyes or blow her nose, just buries her face in the tissue, which the detective later testified remained completely dry. <laughs> okay. So we're now down in the basement. They're down in the, you know your parents are down in the basement. I heard pop, and then my mom, I heard her squeal. Multiple what? pops occur thereafter before she hears the intruders leave through the front door. Once the door closed, I heard my father. He ran up the stairs and all I could hear was moaning. Yeah. Once I heard him starting to move, I, that's when I pulled out the phone and I was trying to call 911. This is untrue. She only realized her father was alive midway through the 911 call. And in that exact moment, you can actually hear genuine fear in her voice compared to her fabricated panic the moment before. The final part of this statement is collecting information to set up the main strategy for Jennifer's interrogation that will take place 10 days later. They go through Jennifer's past and gather intel to lay the foundation for what's known as That's the like, How and Why solution, though. which will be explained in further detail at a later stage. What I want to do now is I want to go into your past, okay? Uh-oh. And start talking about things that have been going on with you. The detective now morphs into a therapist, and what's fascinating is how Jennifer doesn't once question the new line of inquisition. 
Many argue that it was the first time Jennifer was even asked about such matters, giving reason for her willingness to open up. This may have been the first time in her life she was able to- uh, I, mean, I mean, I mean, why would she? She, she has been dodged at lying, she knows she's caught lying at multiple times, and now she catches a break because she knows all she can say instead of the truth. That's it. Now she's happy. Her frustrations and vent Why to would she contest the fucking... Care. The first topic is her parents and the expectations and pressures she was under to succeed, which led to her faking her grades and then her college degree as to not be a disappointment. How did you feel about that? How did you feel about having to lie to your parents? I felt guilty, but every time I tried to bring it up, there was just so much, so much expectation. Did you have any resentment towards them for this? I chose what I chose, um, but in the end I chose my family. She just referred to the ultimatum she was given by her father. The choice to live at home and go back to school, or be completely cut off by her parents and live with her boyfriend. Information gathering on Jennifer's past goes on for roughly two hours and 20 two minutes. Hours. The detective then ends the exchange by putting her under some pressure. It's not a direct confrontation, but it's by far the most uncomfortable position she's been in up to this point. Uh -oh. The detective subtly switches back to the home invasion and how the intruders were able to gain access without breaking in. Like you didn't hear, you didn't hear a doorbell, you didn't hear a door knock, you didn't hear a door kicked in, you didn't I hear... Was... I said I was watching no, TV on the phone. I I don't know how. Yeah, I, I I know we went over that back and back and forth. We don't know how. So somehow they got into your house by getting through your mom. Guys, guys, I feel like I like that at this point she's like overcomplicating and, and, and she she feels like she's always caught in the lie and always getting fucked on. When in fact I. I feel like if this brought up and, and, and you were asked to make up a lie, you could easily get out of this. Like, yo, dude, like it's, it's, it just wasn't locked, yo. Like, we don't, we don't, we don't fucking lock the front door or something, anything. Down on the lower but level. But she's just there, she's frozen. The one who's down she's there. the only one down there. So, it's very confusing. Generally, random events are not, in most cases, random. There's a rhyme or reason why they've come to your house. But from what you've told me inside the house, the only thing that you hear them saying to you is they're looking for money. They're not looking for a specific quantity of money? No. So you're telling me that you you had no involvement in what happened. Ooh, damn. Meaning not saying how the outcome came, but you you had no involvement in, in any type of illegal activity that would have drawn you or the attention of you to have bad people come to your house looking for large sums of money. You're not involved in this any which way. Because the question obviously stands, Jennifer, is you're upstairs and they're downstairs. No. Right? So it's a natural concern when why would they leave you alone? Why would they not do the same to you? You can't answer that question? The only thing I can say is he said I cooperated. The, but I asked him to take me. The number one the guy? Mouth. The number one guy said you cooperated. Okay. Okay. Who's to say this whole thing isn't a lie? That what you're telling me is a lie? Because if you are lying, it's the most cold-blooded thing that I have oh ever faced God. in my life. Oh, he's going hard now. Guys, 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 I don't want to be a, a weirdo Andy, but couldn't you have stalled her out with the other question? There is what? nothing that you've said to me today is a lie. You know the stalling now, strat or whatever? Back to another very difficult question. But if I don't ask it, I'm going to be, you, it's an obvious one. The resentment that you had, that you may have had towards your parents for the interference in your relationship and your life and essentially locking you down in your house. At the end of the day, I love my parents, and I chose to be with them. And if I wanted to, I could have just left, but I didn't. I wanted to stay with them and take care of them. Fuck off. 
So this wasn't some evil plot that you thought up to... Oh my God, no. No interaction, no belief, no... Oh my God, no. This thing at all, whatsoever. No. You don't engage in illegal activity? No. Because you know that it'll be very easy, it, it will be a very easy thing to discredit you on, right? We're, we're in the process of trying to add credibility to what you tell us, and that's through the process of asking people and doing whatever. Through that same process, it will be very easy to find the flaws in what you've said, which again then turns the focus back to you. Okay? I don't... It's a natural progress, it's a natural thing that investigators do. We eliminate people, or we draw our attention to them. It's a natural uh, thing. It's, a, it's not brain surgery, okay? The detective leaves the room for 20 minutes to allow Jennifer to stew in her own thoughts before they end the statement. He comes back to add one last bit of psychological pressure that he carefully disguises as reassurance. Jennifer will leave terrified, but still believe the police are on her side. Okay, we're, we're, uh -oh. we're done, essentially. <sighs> How are you feeling? Sorry, you really scared me. Did I? What did I scare you about? Sit down, sit down and, and t take a load off. Tell me how, tell me how you're feeling and how I scared you. I don't want you walking away from here thinking I'm evil. I want you to walk around from here thinking that this guy is helping investigate my mom's murder and he's going to turn over every stone possible to make sure that we catch Why? How is she so bad? That's what I want you feeling. So I don't want you walking away from here thinking well, that Well, because, uh, because she keeps over and over asking, asking in, in uh, different ways for sort of, sort of reassurance when her only reassurance should be her story and, or whatever, right? I'm... I scared you, or I'm, I'm a bad man. Uh, whatever you guys going to say, very, say very isn't any reassurance. Questions, but it's my job. Okay? You're our only link. You're it. Until your dad regains his back and being able to be, be, be spoken to, right now you're our only link to this case. Her father had bullet fragments lodged in his face that doctors couldn't remove, and a shattered neck bone. Jesus. At the time of this interview, the consensus was that if he did regain consciousness, he would be useless as a witness due to irreversible brain damage. So we're, we may rely on you heavily on, until we can speak to your father. Okay? So don't be afraid. If you've told the truth, the last thing you should be afraid of is, is anything. If you've told the truth and you've been truthful through this whole process, then you're helping. You're doing your part. Okay? And don't be afraid of me. I'm just afraid because, you know, like, I know everything is just all pointing negatively right now, and I, I don't understand why. I'm just, I feel that, like, yeah, it's the way evil, you're, you're evil, speaking terrible to me, it's kind of like, I know you said that you had to say those things, but it's, yeah. it's here, and I've already said it to the special victims yesterday, but there's, like, ideas in my head. Yeah. And I'm afraid to say it out loud, but... Ideas about speculation of what happened, or how it happened? Unfortunately, uh, at times, some of us have to point the finger, or seem like we're pointing the finger, and it really is just to provoke you to see what you're going to do, how you're going to respond. Well, what is she doing? Okay, so it's only a question, and it ha it's been answered, and if you've been truthful, okay, you have nothing to fear, absolutely nothing, okay? <laughs> How is that reassuring her? Police she got caught in the light eight times. Under close observation from this point forward. A surveillance detail was assigned to track her every movement, and she was even monitored at her mother's funeral three days later. According to reports, she was emotionless the majority of the time, only showing what appeared to be feigned grief at certain moments. She never shed a single tear and kept her eyes to the floor or completely shut for the entirety of the service. Jennifer's father had in fact awoken from his induced coma the day prior and miraculously seemed to remember everything from the night of the incident. He would give an official statement in secret on November 16th, and multiple parts of his story contradicted what Jennifer had told police. <gasps> the most significant detail was that she was never tied up, but instead walking around freely and talking with the intruders as if they were friends. He actually spoke with Jennifer over the phone, but was informed by investigators to act amnesic and not to confront her, only to ask her if she thought her ex-boyfriend was behind it. She stated that she was almost certain he wasn't, 
The only issue with Han's statement was that he had suffered minor brain damage from the gunshot, which could be used by a defense team to refute his testimony in court, or even get it thrown out altogether. Furthermore, it was essentially his word against Jennifer's, and their turbulent relationship would also work greatly in the defense's favor. York Regional Police knew they needed a confession for the best possible chance at securing a conviction, so they assigned their most experienced investigator to conduct Jennifer's interrogation. She was called back into the Markham Police Station on the 20th- Kind of unbelievable that they have to play their cards, like, strategically? To, to get a higher chance in the second of November I don't know, at 2:30 p.m. a week and a half after the incident took place. So just for the record, it is the uh, I get it though. 22nd of November 2010. We're at the uh, five district station in the town of Markham. Uh, my computer right now says 2:39 in the afternoon. Okay. Uh, just for the record, my name is Detective William Gates. You can just call me Bill here today. And what do you like to be called? Jen. Jennifer. Jen? Yep. What do you prefer? Jen or Jennifer? Jen. Either. Okay. So Jen, um, you're aware that the um, audio tape and everything's on. Wait. Um, it's the same as last time. William Bill so Gates. You've been here on two other occasions, I understand, on the uh, 9th of November, and I believe again on the 11th of November. Is that correct? Okay. And do you know why we're here today? Mm. Yeah, regarding what? Yeah. So what happened at my home? Okay. And as a result of that home invasion, um, your father uh, and Pam was actually shot, and your mother, uh, Becca, and was actually killed. Is that correct? She's about to get absolutely clapped, right? Yeah, you'll have to speak up a little bit just so I can hear you. Yes. What's unique about this interrogator is how he immediately adopts a no-nonsense approach, yet manages to build rapport and remain sympathetic at the same time. You'll see that he has far less patience compared to the previous investigator, yet seems to create a stronger connection with the suspect. It's a hard thing to explain, but easily observed as you'll soon find out. Uh, so that's what we're going to discuss here today. Jennifer this time around has read her rights to silence rather than her rights as a witness. If she knew anything about the law in Canada, she would be wise to the fact that she is now a suspect. Fortunately for the investigator, she remains completely naive to the situation throughout the opening phase of the interrogation, making her far more susceptible to the strategy he is about to employ. Okay, just hold on a second. Okay, we're, we're having technical difficulties here. <laughs> okay, so that's why they interrupted me. What we're going to do is, if you don't mind holding tight there, I'm just going to move my equipment to the other room. Okay, and then I'll come over and we'll move over there next door, okay? Oh, it's lagging. Okay, I'm going to be right here, though. Okay? With respect to interrogations, it's common knowledge that the psychological manipulation begins before a single word is spoken. The physical layout of the room is designed to accelerate the sense of discomfort and isolation. Oh, and it's fascinating squeezer. to observe how each interrogator has their own unique methods of setting the tone. Knowing how this interrogation plays out allows us to realize this detective's procedure. The considerable distance between him and the suspect will keep her relaxed enough to be influenced by phase one. But this same distance will intensify the pressure once he eventually closes it during phase two. Also, if she wants to go to the door, she has to go through him, right? So there's like no like a... Uh, like she can't feel like she can escape or something. You'll notice this detective is slow with his first strategy, sort of, right? but swift with the second. He takes his time in building trust and establishing rapport. Yet once this initial connection is secured, the transition to aggression will be abrupt and ever increasing from that point forward. Jennifer takes a seat in the room 15 minutes since she was first informed of her rights. It's important to note that she is still free to leave at any time at this point. She is unknowingly a suspect, but not under arrest. So just for the record, this room is being videotaped and audio taped, just like the other one, okay? And I'm just going to grab my chair from across the way, okay? Okay. The detective goes through Jennifer's history of teaching piano and her earlier years of high-level figure skating, which was cut short due to injury. If you didn't get injured, would you still be doing it? Yeah. Okay. That's nice. And did you, as far as that, did you do uh, like competition skating or? And how did you do with that? Well, it was not the top of the pack, but it was the middle average. Yeah, so it's good though. 
but you did oh, actually enjoy it. Bad. It was more than just going for uh, competition. You enjoyed actually. I, I pet by petrified the competition. Okay. <laughs> All right. Do you have any students right now? Or? No. Okay. And why not? Uh, the students I were teaching in my high school. Small talk, Simon. Good one. Okay. Yeah, too big for panel. <laughs> Yeah, I took it in grade school too, but uh, I, I think I got. I went Damn, this guy's good. He's rolling here. Like in, when I was in grade seven. She's smiling and shit. Too, but, uh, I still remember swans on the lake. I didn't know how to play that. That's about it. The detective then goes through Jennifer's work history as a server before that, touching that's on her future plans. That's fake laugh, though. That fake laugh was fucking dank. Man, this guy should be a stripper. In education, Jennifer mentions that she plans to go by her parents' wishes and pursue a career in healthcare. At which point, the primary strategy is initiated. The how and why solution. The detective gradually begins to shift the blame away from the suspect and onto another set of circumstances that prompted the suspect to commit the crime. He starts developing a theme that will afford her a psychological justification in doing it. And this theme will be further established as the interrogation progresses. It starts off subtle so that she remains oblivious to the agenda. Now, if you could pick any job yourself, not talking about anybody else, but if you could pick, it's one of yourself, my questions. What would it be? I love that question. I'm going to be a piano teacher on like when I come home. But in the daytime, I'd like to have a, a simple, maybe like a laptop machine. You could pick any job. Work eight, like eight hours a day and come home and teach piano. This is an answer the detective was hoping for. Jennifer's preferred career choice is at odds with what her parents wanted, so he now builds on the concept of the overly controlling parent and the unfair limitations it causes the child. He then links this concept with the subject of Jennifer's boyfriend and how she was kept from seeing him. Now, um, eventually you were discussing Daniel. What happened with that relationship? Mm, I hate it for my parents at first. They didn't agree with me having a boyfriend. Okay. And then uh, once they found out, they didn't like the fact that he was of mixed race. Okay. And uh, they told me to stop seeing him. Okay. And how did that make you feel? Yes. So he was the person who just filled an empty void for me. So it's that a part of me was missing. When you broke up, you felt the part was missing? Is that what you're saying? When, when they first told me. Guys, 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 you guys are acting outraged. But I mean, I mean, it, it is an outrageous thing, but... Uh, are you guys are acting like this isn't like a common thing that happens behind closed doors in like a lot of families. This is this is probably like extremely recurrent or whatever. I just, I felt like a part of me was missing and I felt like it was how did they find out? Um, one day when my mother came to pick me up, uh, she saw me with him. He had dropped me off. Okay. Dropped you off? Uh, at Pacific Mall. And my mother was coming to pick me up from Pacific Mall. Okay. And somehow they saw each other, I guess? Oh, my mother saw me. I was hugging and kissing goodbye. Okay. That gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> what happened next? Um, I tried to bring him home. And my mother at first was like, you know, bring him home, let us meet him. And when I brought him home, um, oh. they didn't, they automatically didn't like him for some reason. Okay. And I think I told him to stop seeing him. Okay. So Jesus. you were told to uh, stop seeing him. So what happened then? At first I stopped for a while. Um, but like I said, I just felt really empty and I felt just depression and uh, Again. Jennifer then goes on to explain in further detail how she carried on the relationship in secret and how it became more and more of a struggle hiding it from her parents. Now, how has Daniel taken it when your parents said that uh, you couldn't see him anymore? How did he take it? He didn't give a fuck. Yeah. He, was, he was hurt. Oh. Um, and how did you feel? 
She then goes on to explain oh, that wow. she was living with Creative. Daniel at his parents' house for two years, while her own parents thought she was studying at a university. And his parents were, I guess, more liberal than your parents. That's how his parents are. They like they give us money. Yeah, okay. And um, they recognized that you loved each other. Jennifer recounts how she bought a fake diploma for $500 to show her parents. And the many other avenues she went down to keep the lie going. She eventually gets to the day she was found out. How did you end up back home, I guess? Uh, they... Somebody fucking scammed her, dude. Good. I was with in the middle of the night, and uh, she brought you in. She brought me in what day it was and so she was like isn't she home and I wasn't home okay she messed up <laughs> I don't blame her but no okay. Jennifer then goes on to explain the ultimatum she was given and the restrictive measures that were put in place so that she wouldn't be able to see her boyfriend so how has that felt being under those guidelines for the last 18 months mm -hmm. it was okay like uh, it wasn't the best feeling in the world because you know, I just felt like trapped. Okay. But, um, it's what I chose to be with my family. Okay. okay. And so you made a choice between what? Um, living out on my own with Daniel and staying home with my parents. Did you feel you really had a choice or not? There was no choice because family always comes first. Okay. And okay, where dude. do you get that from? Okay. Where do you get that belief? Mm -hmm. The family's number one. Yep. The detective then brings up Jennifer's earlier assertion of being depressed and then affiliates it with the restrictive measures she was living under. What was the worst the depression got? I cut myself. Okay. And when did that happen? Oh. Just, I... Where did you do? Where did you cut? Um, on my wrist. And once people started noticing it, I did other places, but okay. never towards the same spot. So how many cuts do you have on you? Now, none. None? Yeah. They've healed? Okay. And did you want to kill yourself? Yes. Jennifer asserts that she tried to kill herself when she was 19 by overdosing on sleeping tablets. She also states that her self-harm was a distractor from the pain and frustrations she was going through. Did you ever feel that they expected too much of you? How so? Comparison to other people. Okay, so who would they compare you to? Because at this point, is he... Clubmates. Cousins. Is he doing this and like so uh, some of them until I weaken or whatever? Okay. And what did Establishing. They say to you? You've been that person. Okay, so that's pretty hard, right? Hard to take for you. Ah, uh, motive. I'm okay. Hurt my life, so. I'm trying to get motive. Makes sense. Okay. Did you ever feel like? I know you're smart, and they believe you're very smart. But did you ever feel you weren't as smart as what they thought that, that you were? Yeah. Okay, I get that feeling. That it's pretty tough to live up to their expectations. Okay, like your dad ultimately would like to see you be like a doctor. Those were pretty high standards for anybody. Not everybody can be a doctor. Okay. And, but they may have acted like you could have done it no problem. Their expectations were so high that few people would be able to reach that expectation. I'm not just talking about you, I'm talking about anybody. Um, this is C minus it started at a young age. The detective further explores the stresses of living with overly strict parents, and Jennifer explains in further details the way she would cope, which for the most part was lying about her grades and living a double life with her boyfriend. How did it feel having to lie to them all those years? Yeah, yeah, yeah also, it just being a little weird. There's a bit of chat wars, guys. I don't think anybody is, is, is sympathizing uh, with a with a murder or whatever. It's just that sometimes a, a concept is brought up, to, regardless of who's bringing it, and people are reacting to the concept itself and not its involvement with the person on screen. So settle down a little bit, man. They always look down and disappointment. Okay. I'm sure there were days when you actually planned that this is the day I'm going to tell them, and then. 
you just couldn't spit it out. The opening strategy of the how and why solution has now been executed. A connection has been attained and the desired narrative established. The next phase of the interrogation is about to commence, which is first set up by a two-step strategy. Step one is to induce fatigue. Step two is to induce fear. Now, when's the last time you spoke to your dad? Here it comes. See if my brother had to meet him to school. Okay. And what have you and your father discussed about this case? He just asked me if Danny was behind it. Okay. And I told him I don't know 100%, but I don't think he did. Okay. Why would he ask that? Uh oh. Because he believes that we still talk and that he would go to anyone to be with me. Okay. And what do you think about that? I know that he's moved on, so I don't think he would. The detective has Jennifer go through the entire incident once more, but unlike the first investigator, offers no reassurance nor consolation. Jennifer starts fake crying again, yet this time is given no tissues to wipe away her non-existent tears. Yeah. Now, do you think there's any reason why they Jesus. tied you up and didn't tie your parents up? Rolled. Does that seem odd to you? Why does it seem odd? Because I was away um, up here separated from the whole time. And does it make sense that they would leave a witness behind? If they were going to kill somebody? Does that make sense? I guess I think. Just thinking about it. But it makes sense for somebody that was going to kill somebody to leave a witness behind that could describe them. Does that make common sense for killers? It's not. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Do you think that was a mistake they made then? I don't know. They kept saying that they were running out of time. And it just, it doesn't take know. a long time to kill someone. Though, does it? I know. I, I don't know. Jennifer's dramatics intensify as the discussion of the home invasion continues. She's trying to give off the non-verbal cue that she wants to move past the incident. The detective doesn't respond, but continues to go over the different stages of the night in more detail. He jumps from the beginning, to the end, to the middle, back to the end, and then back to the beginning again. None of this is for the purpose of information gathering. He is inducing mental fatigue as to diminish Jennifer's critical thinking. This is often done before Jesus. a direct confrontation, as it can diminish the suspect ability to consider the long-term consequences of a decision. Jennifer will get stressed and tired, not because she is traumatized by the event being recited, but because it's exhausting keeping up such an act when it's not genuine, and this performance eventually starts to dwindle and becomes gradually less convincing. How did the conversation end with that? I heard my father, my mother calling for my father. Okay. She's... And then what? I have to go through this again. Okay. And, um, when you went to bed, was your mom home yet? She's just gotten home, and I went down. I told her I'd be right back, and I, I went down. I said hi to her, and, and I went back up to my room. Okay. Were you injured at all during the whole process? Not really. Okay. Not really. Anything. Step two of the confrontation setup will now commence. The detective employs what is known as the futility technique. He will tell Jennifer that he has an abundance of resources at his disposal and even fabricate much of what he asserts. He's indirectly telling the suspect it is useless to resist due to the overwhelming evidence against her. Now, the reason why I'm here today, okay, Step is two. that I'm an expert, okay, in what we call truth verification. I talk to thousands of people, okay? And I basically know when somebody's not being straightforward with me, okay? I can tell by the language they use, how they answer the question, their body language, how they treat the question, that something's wrong here, okay? This doesn't make sense. 
The detective then gives Jennifer an eight-minute narrative on police tactics and forensic technology, some of which is embellished, but for the most part true. He then asserts that police are able to use infrared satellite imagery to see the occupants inside a household. This is entirely false. Yeah, no and shit! basically, if people are moving around in a house, um, it's like an x-ray, okay? And basically, okay, you're able to tell, you know, are those movements, are those actions, that number of people consistent with the story that we've been told? Um, are the people in the positions that the witnesses are telling us they were in? Uh, or are they different? Okay, and if they're different, why are they different? Is what, what our question guys, becomes, right? Guys, guys, how would you believe this? Wait. Oh. And so at the end of the day, okay, there's so many resources available Permanent to me. Fucking thermals? Um, that at the end of the day, I'm going to know if a person's telling me the truth or not. The detective is now about to initiate the confrontation, but first brings the entire setup full circle by reestablishing the notions of reasoning the and rationale. Believed it. The suspect is fatigued and scared, but still needs to feel the detective is on her side. Yeah, 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 yeah but you would never believe that it would be permanent across the whole, the whole place, the whole thing, and it's recorded and can be used as evidence. No shot. That there's not a single part of any of this that could that could even be possibly b believable. Oh. I can tell you that nothing surprises me in this job, okay? I am well aware that anybody on this earth is capable of making a mistake, okay? I don't care who they are. I don't care um, if they're a priest. I don't care if they're a school teacher. I don't care what the situation is. Given a certain set of circumstances, Everyone has the capability, Jennifer, of making mistakes, doing the wrong thing, okay? Um, the key, though, when I talk to people is when they made a mistake, okay, that's one thing, right? The key is to not keep making the same mistake and to get that information out and get it off their chest, okay? You understand what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, from this case, and I can tell you I've spent literally a week on this case going over information after information, accessing all these sources, speaking to every other expert on the case. And at this point, Jennifer, I know that you've not been truthful with the police. Yes. Okay? You've not told us everything that you know. GG. Purposely. You've spent a considerable amount of time in the last seven years telling half truths, and I can understand why. Okay? Oh damn! You've had a tough life. What's happened to you, to me, equates to abuse, and all the stresses that you've had and forced to lie. I can understand why you did it. Okay, but you're in another situation here where you're under another tremendous amount of stress. And it doesn't feel good inside, does it? It breaks down the person that you are. Because at the end of the day, you're a good person. I know. Does it, it make it easy for to confess? A good heart. In this case, though, you've made mistakes. Okay, and you're involved in this. I know that. Okay, there's no question about it. The only question right now is, are you going to keep making mistakes? Are you going to go on the route that you've gone on over the years and try to pretend that things happen that never happen? Uh oh. Okay, are you going to not face reality here? We know that you're involved. We've done our homework, okay? We have to resolve that now here today. I need to know from you what really happened. And I know why this has happened. You have spent your whole life trying to live up to expectations that you can't meet, okay? And that stress the hell out of you. It's one hell of a failure then. You're a old woman being treated like a 15 year old, okay? What, you've never done anything that terrible in your life, but you're being treated like you have. You're not being treated like the adult that you are. Yes, you made some mistakes, big deal. 
you're not the first person that has gone out and not told their parents that they're dating a guy because in your culture they don't accept it. I understand that. I've talked to people in here that have kept that secret for their whole life from their parents. Okay, so that's not abnormal, but that puts a lot of stress on you, right? That's not easy for you, is it? No. Actually, squeeze now, that, Gigi. What we need to get down to here today, Jen, is what really happened. You need to tell me what went on. Because you know who was in that house that night. You, you do, Jen. There's no question about that, okay? While remaining empathetic and understanding, the detective still needs to keep Jennifer's confidence low. He watches for denials and stops them immediately. Letting the suspect deny her guilt will only increase confidence and morale. This needs to be stripped away as much as possible, as early as possible. There's no question about it. You said that last time. The focus is kept from the magnitude of the crime and concentrated on the justifications of why someone would commit it. Yes, their intentions might have been good, but they're not realistic. They're not, Dan, were they? Ken? Their expectations weren't realistic, were they? You couldn't live up to them, could you? You tried to. Right? Am I right? And finally, you had to bite back, right? You had no other choice. You felt like you had no other options. Now he yells, got you her. thought of everything else, including killing yourself. This is Canada. We're in the 21st century here. She's going to crack 100%. You cannot take everything out of a person. You can have expectations for your kids, but you can't expect them to do everything the way you want. It doesn't feel good to have secrets, does it? No. You have to let me know what happened here, okay? Okay, but you were involved, right? That's the part we need. Okay, we need to hear that from you because we know you were. The detective appears to be getting nowhere, so he now lowers the gauge of admission. A confession to a lesser offense is far easier to attain, but once it is attained, can be used to build on the more damnatory elements of the case. You'll also notice that he uses broad terms that infer guilt, yet don't directly accuse Jennifer of murder. You knew before that night that this was going to happen. I'm going to make that easy on you. That's a true statement, right? You knew before that night that they were coming. Right? Ah, oh, come on, man. Ken? It's not worth it anymore. It's hurting you. She seems to be on the cusp of giving some form of admission, yet wants reassurance as to what it means for her own sake. She asks this question nine times throughout this interrogation. It's one of the few things investigators can't actually lie about, Fuck. as it's been used countless times in the past to get a case thrown out under misdirection. They can avoid the question, yet they can't afford any false promises with respect to sentencing. I need to know the details I can't even say. But I can tell you one thing is that we already know, so you can't change that. I know you did. But it got too far ahead of you, right? You didn't see, you didn't think this far ahead, did you? But once they started, once they came in, you couldn't stop it, could you? Could you? Jen? I was scrolling, I was looking for something. Hmm? I know. Why did they stop for you? Hmm? Easy. I don't know who they were. But you were part of the planning, right? You have to tell me that part, and then we're going to work through it together. Do you know what I'm saying? You didn't want this, to, you wanted to stop it. You have to prove that to me now. Because at the end of the day, we have to stop this from happening to someone else. Right? What's up to me? Jen, we're going to have to deal with it one step at a time, okay? I'm going to be honest with you. I need to know what you did. 
Well, sure, I admit it. You it's... and I are going to work through this together. Because the most important part is, of this whole thing is that we do the right thing for your mom. Right? Uh, I kind of. Uh... Her voice right now. I'm working for your mom. That's my job. And I have to get to the bottom of this for your mom. Appealing to compassion isn't necessarily uncommon when the crime is first-degree murder, yet it can send a mixed message when a justification for the crime was a focus point early on. The detective takes his chance with it, which at first appears to work. Jennifer initially responds in a poignant manner, but you'll soon come to notice that her empathy, alongside her concern, is solely focused on herself. Well, we gotta start... But what's happening to me? Well, I don't know at this point. Okay, because I don't know what you're going to tell me other than that you were involved. But I need to hear what, fails. what this all was with a latch, this effort to live your own life, to be your own person, to make your own decisions. Look at all your friends. Look evil. at all the people around you. Does anyone else have if a These people are absolutely pure evil, though. For 9 o'clock at 24 years of age, you had no much left. I don't know. Yeah, and I know that. 15. Not really. Ah, and anybody yeah. else in your situation would have done the exact same thing. The only thing different is I would well, I mean, say no. that they uh, of course. it a lot earlier. They would have looked for a way out. When did you first start planning this? When was the final straw? What was the final straw? Obviously, there's no That's what this is all about. Do you want to be a good person here? Jennifer knows exactly what questions to answer and what ones to ignore. Any time a question is non-incriminating, she gives a response. Yeah. Why is saying torturing your children is okay? XW, like like I said that. That's not what I said though. What what, what is your problem? You're so weird. See, this is why this is why I this is why it, 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 chatter is so weird about videos like this is that you can't separate a concept from who's saying it. You're, you're, you're just weird. Yet when well, they what are is your problem? she remains silent. She you're, you're really out here like justifying murder, making me f trying to gas me into saying that, uh, yeah, you're just weird. No doubt feeling the pressure, but still very aware of the situation and the potential ramifications of her words. Just permit this guy, man. That's fucking weird You know shit. when a good person makes a mistake, they have to face that mistake, right? Right? What do you think should happen? I don't know. You're going to prove to people that you know what the right thing to do is. That's what is going to happen. That's what your mom wants right now. She's watching us here. She's wondering, is Jen going to make the right decision here? Is Jen, after all of this, going to come out on top doing the right thing? Why well, just do it? It, 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 it's it's like saying um, oh every parent needs to be perfect otherwise they deserve to die and like oh you disagree with that uh, it's like dude Free, just don't be like that I'm here for your mom well you have to tell it's one of those situations you know what we know that what you did okay but you have to be able to explain to me what happened okay I can't tell you what's exactly going to happen to you. You just have to be brave here. You have to be brave. Her pants were racist though. No? Three hours. Listen, listen, man, listen. There's a lot of angles to this. It doesn't matter how you put it. It did. 20 it doesn't justify seconds. anybody is dying or being murdered. Jennifer to display genuine emotion. The investigator would later testify this was the first moment the suspect was being authentic. He allows her to fixate on whatever thought brought this on and remains completely silent for just under two minutes. Like, like you're giving, you're giving the like the common family, the um, the average Joe family, so much credit. You, uh, you act like like the vast majority, like, you act like, you act like everybody has no prejudice uh, uh, against uh, the, their child having a certain uh, a boyfriend or girlfriend of a certain, of a certain race or whatever. Dude, dude, behind closed doors, it, let's say, man, it's, it's, it doesn't justify anything. Sorry, thank you.
that we're supposed to take in. What? Okay. So we're supposed to take the whole family out? No, just me. What went wrong? The detective now has one foot in the door. It's not an outright confession, but Jennifer has now admitted to planning the home invasion all along. And although she asserts that she was the intended target while her parents were meant to be spared, the information she has now given is enough to place her under arrest. Jennifer is no longer going home after this interview. The detective now presses for more information on the amended storyline. It's essentially step one of day one all over again, but from a more powerful position. He knows she is still lying, and now locks her into as many lies as possible within the new narrative. What happened? Why did it change? Okay, what do you know? How come it was supposed to be you? Because I didn't want to be here anymore. Why not? Because I was a disappointment. Okay, you made mistakes, but... Nothing that couldn't be corrected. Why was it supposed to be you? Why did it happen this way then? I don't know. Everyone could be free from me. I was disappointed in everything. Okay. But why did it have to happen this way? Because when I tried suicide, I failed. What did you want done? <laughs> How? Okay. So who did you get to do this then? We don't know who he is. I get his number. Okay. And what's his number? Oh, that's just going to be fucked. She skirts around the questions surrounding her accomplices and gives multiple fake names. She stated that she got the number of the supposed hitman from an acquaintance named Rick, and that she took everything from there over the phone. It becomes apparent she doesn't want to give up, or even mention her boyfriend, so for the time being the detective allows her to recount her amended narrative in the manner she pleases. She gets to the moment she instructed the hitman over the phone not, about her planned suicide. Um, I, I guess I'm pretty this is not because she wants to protect the boyfriend, it's mostly because she doesn't want uh, them to investigate any further past these guys because they would snitch or something would happen or whatever like it It's like her one last attempt at trying to say oh all of that and them not being able to investigate any of that, right? Suicide I told him that I wanted to be killed And did he think that was something crazy? Is that, are you sure that's what you want? And I said yes Because I don't think many people get that request Do you? No, but that's what I wanted, and he asked me over and over to make sure I was sure, and I said I was sure. Okay, so what did you ask him to do then? Come take me out and then leave. Okay. Why did they do it when you were, um, when your parents were there then? <laughs> Never alone. In the next time. Okay. Like what? So that meeting you had with Rick, you told him what you wanted? No, I just said that I wanted, if he knew anybody who could take care of something that I needed, just that I wanted to be killed. And he said what? Here's the number. Did he have the number with him that day? Yes. Okay. What did he say he would do? He just like told me to take care of it. Oh, so the strat worked mm -hmm. then? So your specific request to him was what? The detective strat. So he does come into the house, and you're the obvious only young girl there, right? Yeah. Okay. When he came to your her your room, yeah. what discussions did you have with the guy that came to your room? The real discussions you had, not what you told us. Where was the money? And I showed him where the money was. Okay. But he obviously said, I'm here to do what you asked. He never said anything like that. What did he say? He just like hands behind your back. Did he discuss ways with you how he would do it? No. Did you request any way for him to do it? To make sure no one else was around. Okay. Why didn't they do it the way you wanted? I don't know. I asked them. I asked them to take me with my mom when they took them away. 
It doesn't seem to make sense. I know, it doesn't make sense to me. Because that was supposed to be. Okay. Can you sit up for a minute, Jen? Jesus. Okay, look at me. The detective wants Cra to crazy how they, when they asked her to, to tell a, tell a story, she had so much trouble getting it out because it was so mixed with, with truths and fakes or whatever. That now that it's only lies, she's fucking going crazy, opening the damned with right all the bullshit. And the second Unleash the garbage, dude. Is about to commence. Only this time, it will be a lot more aggressive, as he doesn't have to worry as much about the suspect locking up or requesting counsel. She is under arrest and going to jail after this interrogation, no matter what. Look at me. Okay. What I do believe is that you went to somebody. And I do believe that night you paid them the $2,000. But what's not true is it was never for you. Okay, Jen, no. Okay, you went to this person and you asked them to do a job. And the job was for your parents. You asked them to do this job on your parents, Jen, okay? Let's be truthful, okay? Nobody's gonna come there and get the wrong people. If you wanted to kill yourself, Jen, you're not gonna pay somebody $2,000 to do it. I couldn't do it myself. Okay, but there's other ways, okay? And if that was gonna happen, they could have taken you outside and done it anywhere. It wouldn't matter, would it? If you really wanted to die, all they would have had to do is pull up beside you in a car and shoot you. You made a specific request, and the job was for your mom and dad. Okay? Nobody's going to come in there and do the wrong job. Okay? Nobody's going to do that. They came, you paid, and they did what they were supposed to do. And the plan was for your parents. Mm -hmm. Okay? Jen. You have to be honest about it. This is the only thing that's in contention here, okay? You made the mistake, okay? Everybody understands. Everybody in this police department feels sorry for you. I can tell you that right now. Nah, okay? no shots. Because they've seen what you're going through. It's so obvious, okay? That's that fucking all capping. This they put out, basically, this is like a volcano, all right? And at one point, it was just too much, and you erupted, okay? And you made a bad decision. Okay? And once you hired this guy, there was no turning back. Now, in the original story, you said that you hid your cell phone. Okay? If it was for you, you wouldn't have hid your cell phone. That would have never happened. So it's, it's in conflict. It's not hidden. It's just, I, I put it there naturally. Okay. It's what I naturally did. Okay. But you said on tape that you hid it there and that they didn't know about it. And then again, use this shot where he interrupts her or whatever, and, and, and make sure that she doesn't get her lie out, she doesn't believe her own lie or whatever. Mine, Jen. Right. All they wanted was so much success out of you, they were the not the even comments looking at it. you as a person. They were looking for a success story. Instead of just saying, whatever Jen wants is what's good for us. Whatever she's happy with. As long as she's happy in her life, I'm happy with it. If she wants to work at Eastside Mario's for the rest of her life... What the fuck is Eastside Mario's? Fine. If she wants to be a piano teacher, that's great. If she wants to continue figure skating, that's wonderful. Why would somebody shoot someone they didn't have to shoot? I don't know. I can't figure that out. And actually not shoot the person they're supposed to shoot. I don't know. But I'm trying to figure it out. Okay. Why didn't you tell us this that night then? You were scared. Scared of what? Telling the truth? Yes. That I wanted to die. Ah, fuck okay. off. Listen, listen. She knows it's not believable. Die, you would tell us everything because it wouldn't matter. Jen, if you really wanted to die, you would tell us everything because it doesn't really matter. Right? It does matter because the wrong person got hurt. And my dad is suffering. Fuck you. What is this? I appreciate that's what happened in the end, but that's what was supposed to happen, okay? The good thing about this is your dad did live, and that went against the plan. If you could make this decision over, you would change it, okay? You would change it, right? 
course. Because I knew he was going to get hurt. Of course okay. I would. Jen, you knew who was going to get hurt. That's the whole issue here. Okay, that's the whole issue here. You gave them the plan for your parents, right? That's all I need to hear. No. Jen, you did. No, and this is not going to go anywhere because I wanted them to kill me. Tell me what happened. So she's actually never going to get affected. She's never going to get affected. Then all you have to do is here is tell me right now. That Bill, yes, I made a mistake. Bill, yes, I made a mistake. This plan was for my parents. The detective gets no further admission from this point forward. Yeah, that's what I saw. So he leaves Jennifer alone for three minutes to play with her hair before he comes back and charges her with first degree murder. Okay. I need you to listen close to me, okay, Jen? At this point in the investigation, okay, I'm going to be arresting you for murder, okay? Survive. Also Bye. attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Holy. Do you understand that? Just have to tell me if you understand those charges. Just say yes or no. Yes. Okay. So what we're going to do right now is, do you have your own lawyer? No. No? Okay. Do you have a lawyer you would like to speak to that you know of? No. Okay. Would you like to speak to duty counsel? Absolutely clap on. I just want to someone who can help me understand. Okay, so who would that be? I don't know. Is that what? So do you have a lawyer? You said that you were on my side. Okay, I am on your side, Jen. What oh, like come on. Okay, dude. Did has she not watched one, literally, out of any police movie at all? It's just, just one one scene. Okay, dude. I don't have, I don't have any idea what to do. you want me to call duty counsel for you? Okay. Okay. Or is there any other lawyer that you would like? Okay, so at this point, you wish to speak to duty counsel then? Sure. Okay, so what I'm going to have to get you to do is actually empty all your pockets on the table here. I'm going to make sure that they're making a call to duty counsel, and we'll line that up, and you can speak to the duty counsel in private, okay? We've uh, made a call to duty Guys, counsel. What, what, what's duty counsel? Up, okay? Need a drink of water or anything? Okay. Uh, I do have to uh, go ahead and speak to these officers, but I'll come back and speak to you. Okay? How is she still convinced that he that he's we on her side? Take, we got to take care of the lawyers, okay? That's the priority right now, okay? Wait, wait. This this is her biggest enemy, and he's gonna get somebody who's on her side. Yet she wants this guy to stay because she thinks he's. This is how good of a job this guy did, right? The next time Jennifer would see this detective would be when he testified at her trial. It began on the 14th of March, 2014, and Jennifer pled not guilty to all charges. Her interrogation tape was one okay. of the more... Who, who drew this? Guys, who, who is the sketcher for this? Damning pieces of evidence put forward by the prosecution. <laughs> Yet the most damning were the 116 Listen. text messages between her and her boyfriend in the six hours leading up to the murder. They thought using burner phones to communicate would cover their tracks. Yet forensics were able to uncover the entire discussion just one <laughs> month after the incident. They spoke in detail about how the crime would be carried out, and it was enough to convict them both, as well as each of the intruders who were linked to the crime via DNA evidence and witness testimony. They were all found guilty of first-degree murder and given a life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years. Jennifer Pan is now 34 years of age. She is currently serving her sentence at the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Kitchener, Ontario. She will be yeah. first eligible for parole in November of 2035. 35? What about your dad? He drives a Mercedes and he loves that baby. Is that right? <laughs> Jesus, okay, dude. That was actually pretty good. And hey, that was pretty good.